Well, we are, we are honored and privileged to have John and Cheryl Easter with us. They are great missionaries serving across the whole continent of Africa. They come highly acclaimed. And just being in the service one time, I am telling you, you are in for a treat. Open your heart, let God speak to you. Would you give uh, John Easter a warm welcome, a new hope welcome as he comes to bring the word this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Jeff and Pastor Austin. Wow, it is wonderful to be at New Hope Urbandale, amen? Isn't it wonderful? What a beautiful day that we're gonna have, some sunshine coming through. This is my kind of day, to be in God's house, and I am so excited to be able to connect with you for the first time. And uh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful honor for my wife and me, Cheryl, who is with me and is not always able to travel with me. But after 33 years of marriage and three of the most wonderful grandchildren in the world, it is, uh, it's been a good life. And one on the way, she just told me. That's right. I have some friends that have known this church for a long time. Randy Hurst and Sam Farina that are mentors of mine who have spoken highly of New Hope. And the, the legacy that you have as a missions congregation your heart, your passion, the generations of investment and giving, and how another generation is emerging because you've been very intentional to do that and to be able to ensure that um, this church continues to be able to be a force in our world uh, to, advance, to the advancement of the gospel. Um, and, and, it, and I always enjoy moments where I can connect with congregations like you, with friends. And already this morning, just getting to meet so many, it's, it's just been wonderful. Thank you for being so generous and open with your hearts. And, uh, and you've made an impression already. I want to do two things this morning. The first thing I want to do is I, I want to give you an overview, about a 30,000 foot view of what's happening on the continent of Africa today. As you know, your missions theme is all for, or Africa for Jesus. And of course, with AGWM, it's all for Jesus. And we do believe that, don't we? And once I do that, then I want to pivot and I want to speak to all of us this morning about our motivations. What is it that should truly motivate you and me to better align our lives with what God is already doing redemptively in our communities and around the world? And how do each one of us in this room, no matter who we are, find significance in doing that? But let's begin with Africa, Africa. If I were to show you a map of the continent like the one behind me, you may not be aware of this, but you can put all of the United States, you can put all of Western Europe, China and India and Japan on top of Africa and you still have not covered its landmass. Isn't that amazing? Over 1.2 billion people growing in over 54 countries and island states that run from the Sahara down to the coastlands of South Africa and from Mombasa in Kenya all the way to the other side in a great large city in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Did you know it takes me as long to fly from the very tip of South Africa in a city called Cape Town north to a place called Ouagadougou? Can you turn to your neighbor and say Ouagadougou? which isn't nearly north of the continent as it takes for me to fly from New York to London. What's interesting about this continent is its scale, its vastness, its size, well, it's immense. With all the tribal identities and well over 1,500 languages, this is a continent that has so many commonalities but so much diversity. Burkina Faso is so different than Ethiopia, and Ethiopia is a different planet in many ways than a place called Malawi, Africa. This is a continent of mystery. It's a continent that for all of us, there are certain imagery that we have when we hear the name Africa. But for many of us as well, we have other kinds of images. I remember when I was a young boy, I was taking a geography class in elementary school, and in this book it was time for a certain lesson and my teacher asked me to turn the page and as I did I turned it and at the very top was one word in bold Africa and the very first sentence was Africa is known as the dark continent 
And in my mind, I begin to wonder, why do they call this place the dark continent? I mean, does the sun not shine as brightly in that part of the world as it does my own? But as Cheryl and I begin to age and sense the call of God and for the first time arrive in a place called Lilongwe, Malawi, with our three young little boys to live life for the next 20 plus years, we began to recognize that even within that context as we saw some tribal conflict and famine and disease and endemic poverty and human trafficking that ran across southern Africa and up into east and central and west that there are many reasons why all of us have this imagery that reinforces a stereotype of Africa as the dark continent. And many times as we look at the headlines today and we read or we're watching the news, those images continue to be reinforced as we see this place that yes, in many ways is a mystery, but it seems like so much bad and so much human suffering is occurring there. And yet there's something that we often don't hear in the evening news, what we don't read in the headlines, something that many times we don't read on blogs, and and that is this, is that The dark continent has today seen a great light and that light is Jesus. That there is no other place as I stand in front of you despite this one narrative that continues sadly to touch the life of so many on a daily experience. Whereas there's another story emerging with power and force that most of us never hear about. That Fox News never tells us about. That the New York Times never writes about. That someone never blogs about. And that is this. That there is no other place on the planet today where Christianity is growing faster than in Africa right now can you say man isn't that wonderful it is a place where we're seeing God move into places of hopelessness and bringing hope where missionaries that you are supporting are serving from east to north to south to west that are moving into contexts where many times are resistant in cities where churches are needed and jungles and in the Sahara Wherever people are found and you have partnership in that. And that's really why we're here today. To be able to say, God, what are you doing in the world? And particularly for this emphasis in Africa. And what we see is we see a story that's being written that in our own lifetimes, not in years behind us or years ahead of us, but now as we sit here this morning, this is occurring. These are the headlines. Did you know that just 25 years ago in our own movement, just within our own denomination, there were only 2.3 million adherents loosely affiliated with the AG across the continent today. As of this year, there are now over 23 million. Isn't that amazing? At that time, we had about 11,400 churches. And today... Over 83,000 local congregations, just like you, a few hours ago, met for worship. That's, that's amazing. What's interesting about that is, is that's why I love doing what I do. For years, I served as the director of Africa's Hope, which is our ministry and training arm, to be able to empower men and women called for gospel ministry, to plant new churches, to disciple communities, to mobilize them for evangelism. And at that time, we only had about, well, 49 schools. And today, we now have over 352 schools as of January of this year. 23,000 students every single year are now being trained to plant new churches. Hallelujah. And that is your legacy, you see, because you have been investing in Africa for years. You You have been equipping and sending missionaries to Africa for years. This is not just a story in Africa. This is your story as well. You have a tangible, real part of that. You have been praying and laboring. You have been giving sacrificially. You have been concerned. You have supported. You have demonstrated your love. And today we get to do that again. And why do we need to do that? Well, the first thing is, is that we really believe that spirit-empowered, biblically trained leaders really are the hope of Africa. It's like these men who are walking in the streets of Kaya and Burkina Faso, highly surrounded by Islam, highly resistant, and yet many of them have sacrificed deeply, been faithful, and planted brand new churches for the first time. And there are some that you don't see there that last year gave their lives, literally, 
as martyrs for the gospel. Some of them students I had known. These are the things that are transpiring. It's dynamite. In the midst of all of the hopelessness and darkness, there is this power of the gospel that's being released on the continent. Where people dare to believe, and just like you, where your life has been transformed by the grace of God, that is happening for not just a handful, but by the millions today. And yet, and yet there are so many places that still need to be reached. Let me just let you see some of the faces of the leaders that are emerging that our missionaries work with across the continent. Let's watch this video. These are the men and women that you see. The young man walking near that cliff was in Niger. His name is Samson. Someone who's planted multiple churches in very difficult, spiritual, resistant places. In so many ways, it reflects the climate and the land in which they live, which is hard and arid. And many of them who sacrifice in ways that very few of us could really understand on the level of giving oneself. I often meet individuals like Samson and some of them have the opportunity to be able to equip and train myself. And when I see them, I often ask myself, what is it that motivates them to do what they do day in and day out, despite the kind of context and resistance that they face, where they remain so devoted to the Lord and so focused in giving themselves for this purpose? Oftentimes, I'm asked that myself by others. What is it that motivates you, John, to do what you do? And my question this morning is the same for you. What is it that motivates you and you? What motivates all of us in this room to be able to ensure that our lives, if we're followers of Jesus, to align our affections and passions, our priorities, our decision making, our resources with what God is doing redemptively, with his purpose in the world, right here in your own backyard and around the world? Theologians often refer to a concept in scripture with Latin words called the Imago Dei. When they refer to the Imago Dei, it literally means the image of God. And so profound is this image in scripture, you can find it from Genesis to Revelation, threaded between each book along the storyline of the Bible. And it emerges with force and power, primarily when God calls his people to action in the world. It speaks to the intrinsic worth of every human person, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. No one is excluded, everyone is included. The problem that we have with the image of God, however, is that we know that scripture teaches us that this image, as, as valuable as it is, has been twisted and warped. It has been disturbed to the point that many times it's difficult to recognize the image in others. 
And even though for myself as a missionary, I know it to be biblically true, it inspires my heart, I know it's scripturally truth. And yet the problem that I have is, is that when I walk into the world and leave this service and this environment of worship and an encounter the world around me in our cities and in our communities and the world at large, we see and we encounter, we experience a world that has been twisted, a world that is volatile and unpredictable, a wounded world. And as we look at humanity, many times we know what the Bible teaches us, and yet it is difficult to see the image of God in other people. Is that right? And if we're not careful, if I'm not careful, I will allow the emotion of my experiences every day as I go into the schools, or if I go into the marketplace, go to where I live in my neighborhood or on my job site, to hijack what I know to be truth. And before long, I extend my hand out and I'm jaded to the very world that God is calling me to reach and calling you to care about. The image of God. And there's really three things that primarily motivate my life that I'd like to share with you that I think are absolutely foundational for every single follower of Jesus when it comes to how we care deeply about world missions. And the first one is what I like to call value. Value. You see, if it's true, I mean really true, man, that every single person is made in the image of God, then that means that every individual, no matter who they are or where they are from, are the object of God's love and desire to save and to restore that brokenness back into his purpose. Can you say amen? You see, that means that no matter my nationality or my ethnicity, My geography, my culture, the language that I speak, my gender, my age, what I've done for good in life or bad in life, and whether I even acknowledge that God exists, and if he does, does he even know about me? That because I'm made in his image, I am the object of his love and desire to transform my life as I experience his grace and be changed by it forever. Hallelujah. Value. You see, value then becomes the lens of how I view the world, how I view you and you, how I view those in my community and neighborhood, those that I go to school with, those in Africa and Latin America and the Oceania and Eurasia. Is the lens that teaches me that this is how God views the world. And what I've learned about value is, is that what God values, I am called to value. And what God loves, the church is called to love. Value. But if value is important, the second one is more so. And this I like to call capacity. You see, if it's true that every single person is made in the image of God and therefore the object of his love and desire to save and restore that brokenness, into his glory, then it means that every individual in this room and around the world and who's ever been born has been created by God with the capacity to be able to say yes to the gospel and be transformed by the power of his grace. That means no matter my nationality, my ethnicity, my culture, the language that I speak, my gender, my age, what I've done for good in life or bad in life and whether I even believe that God exists because I'm made in his image he loves me and he has built within me the capacity to say yes to his grace and be changed by it so it doesn't matter then if I speak Chichewa or Tumbuka or Ngoni or Afanaromo or Arabic or Lingala That because I'm made in his image, he loves me. I am valuable to him. And within me is the ability to reach out and receive his love and be changed. Really changed. Really changed. You see, let's just be real for a moment, right? I mean, if we didn't believe in capacity, man, why in the world should we even come this morning? Why turn on the lights? Why go through all of the routine? 
Why go through worship? Why give in the offering? Why in the world would we ask for a pledge, a faith promise from every single individual to consider what we could do collectively to be able to advance and support more missionaries and projects to introduce people to Jesus? If it were just a roll of the dice, if it's by chance that perhaps you can come to faith, but we're not so sure about you. Perhaps you can, but we don't know about you. Your deeds seem to demonstrate possibility, but we just don't know. Because if I don't believe in capacity, man, I'm not going to Africa. If I don't believe that every single person is a candidate to truly be dynamically changed by the power and grace of God, then there will be self-limitations that I impose upon my life as to how much I involve myself in your life, much less someone else's life. How much I give, how much I pray, how much I go. I may not be then willing to walk across the street in my neighborhood to share my faith and my compassion with my neighbor, to care about the person that I'm in the classroom with at school, to be able to truly care for people in my community, much less give in a way that truly brings change to the world around us. You see, capacity, if I really believe in it, if I embrace that, if I know it's biblically true, it changes the lens of how I see humanity. It drives me to the world. It means that no one is outside of God's grace. And it doesn't matter then, you see, if I find myself kneeling in a mosque in Tehran, Iran, or kicking dusty soil on the back roads of Dodoma, Tanzania, or find myself walking the streets and the urban environment of Durban, South Africa, or even driving in a pickup truck in these beautiful fields here in Iowa. You see, no matter where we end up indivi finding individuals, because we're, because we're all made in his image, it allows us to see the world as God sees it with its hope and optimism. That for every single one of us in here, he calls us to that purpose. I have a student, I'll just call him Riaz. It's not his real name. He came to us many years ago. And you can't see his face in this photo with these groups of students that oftentimes don't have the same kind of facilities we have in America. But they are close by a mango tree near a building, being prepared to be sent out as church planners to highly resistant areas along with their families that are not in these photos. Riaz came for his master's degree, highly educated, spoke several languages, left his wife and his two young daughters, his mother and father in Pakistan in order to study in Malawi to be able to receive a good education because he felt as though God was calling him to give his entire life to reach a people group in the north of his country. After three years of devoted study, performing well, had these incredible characteristics of humility and love and compassion for people. I mean, he loved people. He graduated and immediately went back to Pakistan, was reunited with his wife and two young girls, his mom and dad who were aging. And as they were together within just six months of being reunited, he went to a train depot, put his wife and two young daughters on that train and together they went three hours into the Northern Territory that had been radicalized, known in this territory to this day as a radical territory where no churches, according to our data, had ever been planted. And by foot they got out at their arrival, their destination, and walked kilometers into this village area asking permission by the chiefs to live among them, which they were granted permission, but they were marginalized, persecuted, treated badly. But they were faithful. They were devoted. And within two years, nearly two and a half, they had led over 200 people for the first time to Jesus Christ, who were transformed in their lives now attending a local church that they had planted under this lean-to of an old building where they would gather on certain days trying to go undetected, where all of a sudden these new believers coming out of Islam and this radicalism were beginning to see this hope. Their lives were, were having fruit. There was this love that was emanating. And as more believers began to join and be one to the Lord, the persecution began to increase. And on one day, I found myself in Miami, Florida. 
speaking to a missions conference and then I walked off the platform, got in an Uber, began to move to the airport because I had to get back to Malawi to teach a class. And in that Uber, all of a sudden, my phone began to buzz. I pulled it out of my pocket and another student of mine serving somewhere in the Middle East right now began to say, Dr. Easter, you should know. And all of a sudden, my smile ended up going into a point of being very serious as I read his words that in the Sunday prior to my trip to Miami, these men in the village had had enough of him winning their people to Jesus, came in in the middle of the service, became violent with the people sitting on the floor on one side and on the other, the children in the front, punching and kicking, humiliating people, took Riaz as this pastor and threw him on his back just to humiliate him, dragged him on, by his legs out in front of this dirt road and without explanation other men had gathered and began to punch him and kick him until he fell to the ground and when he began to bleed that blood began to mix with the dirt on the ground caking on his body until he fell unconscious and they continued to beat him beat him and beat him until finally their anger had spilled over and they began to go back to their village areas sending a message to all those new believers and only two men, only two that he had discipled had the courage to go back and retrieve his body thinking they would bury him. And when one of them knelt down, felt him still breathing, put Riaz on his shoulder and those two men tried to go undetected, walking through that village area. And when they came to that train depot, others in the congregation brought his wife and two young girls who were scared to death. And they went three hours to the south with them, with this Riaz, with him being unconscious. They put him into a hospital where he stayed for over 60 days in treatment. And when he was released, within one week, one week, he took his wife, his two daughters. They had prayer with their extended family and friends. Got back on that train, went three hours back to the north, and on foot walked that same trail back into that village, into that community where they tried to kill them. And they started over where they are still there to this day. Hallelujah. See, when I ask Riaz, why, Riaz, would you go back to that area? He said, Dr. Easter, he said, if, he said in a little over two years, for the first time, we met people who had never heard about Jesus. And over 200 of them came to Jesus. And we love those people. He said, if 200 can come to Jesus in a little over two years, if we go back and give our lives in that community, perhaps the whole village will come to Jesus. Capacity. Capacity. You see, if... If you don't believe your neighbor can come to Jesus, you're probably not going to reach out to them and show them much attention outside of being friendly, neighborly. If you believe the African cannot be transformed by the grace of God, you may give $5 here and $10 here. You may pray from time to time when Pastor Jeff or others ask you to engage in a moment of prayer for Africa. If you don't believe the person in Asia and the person in Asia Pacific and the person in Latin America and the Oceania and Eurasia, then you, you'll probably just kind of play around and do what we can, feel better about ourselves. But down deep, down deep, you'll wonder, can people really come to Jesus? You see, in our part of the world, what we see is some of the hardest are transformed by the power of God in such ways that it always teaches us, reminds us that anyone, anyone is a candidate for God's grace. Anyone can be changed, I mean authentically changed by his power. You see, capacity is what allows you not to give up on the person that you work on the factory floor with, that you've testified and shared your faith, shown compassion, but they kind of stick out the arm of resistance and they're jaded to your Jesus. But you don't give up. 
It's why you continue to pray for your grandchildren that seem to abandon the faith that you hold so dear, even though you raised them in it, and now they don't want anything to do with your religion. It's why we continue to do what we do in our communities right here in Urbandale and the larger Des Moines Metroplex. Why? Because we believe in capacity. It's why we reach out and go to India and help people who cannot nurture themselves and ensure that we're showing the compassion of Christ while we plant churches in areas that today do not have them among the millions upon millions. It's why we give to schools in Tanzania and equipment for playgrounds and then make sure that we're supporting vehicles that advance our missionaries and their work on fields. It's why we gave in a faith promise. It is why we do what we do. Capacity. Because I know me and if God can change me, he can change anybody. But if value and capacity are important, the third is what it's all about and I like to call this significance. You see, if it's true, man, that every single person is made in the image of God, and therefore they're the object of his love and desire to save and restore and heal that brokenness, heal that image once again into God's purpose for our lives, and therefore every person has been created by God uniquely to have the capacity to say yes to the gospel and be changed by it, then it means that every single individual as well, no matter who they are, their nationality, their ethnicity, their culture, their language, their gender, their age. No matter the experiences they've had in life, God has intended every single person to have significance, not just in some life thereafter, but in this life. Because God did not just simply save us from something, he has saved all of us for something. And the question for all of us in this room, no matter your age, if you're a dental hygienist or an architect or a school teacher or a primary caretaker of your family, no matter, no matter if you're an administrator or a business owner or an employee on a factory floor or a farmer, no matter who we are in this room, what shaped our lives for the better or the worse, what ties us all together is that God desires for all of us to have significance in this life. But how is that found? Let me introduce you to a friend of mine. Two years ago, this photo was taken. And you're gonna see me praying for them, but you'll see two men in the picture below. And if you're watching online, we're having to guard the face of our friend who's shrouded for his protection. You see, our friend in the blue shirt there, smiling so large, and I'll not share his name with you either, is the evangelism director of the Ethiopian Assemblies of God Church, who was born and raised in the same area and village remotely as our friend who was a religious imam just two and a half years ago. This man ended up giving his life for the radicalization of Islam living 40 kilometers off of one of the most unstable places in the world, Somalia. This photo that was taken with us was because I was visiting and checking on one of our newly planted and established Bible schools with 52 students in it. What's amazing about the stories of these two individuals is, is one was one to Jesus at a young age and God called him to ministry, came to our Bible school in the capital city and yet still had a heart for his people down in the southeast where he had come from among the Oromo Muslims. On visiting his parents one day, our imam friend whose face is shrouded learned that he was coming, who at that time was giving leadership over two mosques and decided to take some of his elders in his mosque and prepare to be able to kill our evangelism director in order to send a message to the community that this is what happens when you forsake Islam. And when our evangelism director walked in in that village that day unprepared, not knowing, taken by surprise as he walked up to the bomas of his aging mother and father to say hello to them who he had not seen in many months, these men surrounded him and started throwing stones and hurling insults and preparing to beat him to death in front of his family. And in the middle of it, this imam had a rock. And all of a sudden, 
this sense of terror came over him. And in the middle of throwing insults towards our evangelism director, he ended up looking at the men that he had called and insulting them, yelling at them and saying, tomorrow, tomorrow, turned his back in the middle of the entire episode and began to run to the other side of the village area where he then crawled into his own boma in the middle of the day. And in the midst of his dread and terror of this experience that he could not explain, he ended up falling asleep. And whether it was a dream or a vision, he wasn't sure. But as he shared his words with he, me, he said, I ended up having this vision of Isa, Jesus. He said, I had heard of him, but I had never encountered him. He said, I was, I was traumatized in his presence as he welcomed me and loved me and invited me. And he said, when I woke up, I was so overwhelmed that I crawled out on my hands and knees. And he stood, I sat there on my hands and knees and started weeping. And then I stood to my feet and ran back across to the village area where I fell down at the feet of our evangelism director, begging his forgiveness forgiveness revealing what I had planned why we were throwing stones and insulting him and begged his forgiveness then stood up and looked at him in the face and said please please tell me more about Isa and on that day on that hour he was led to faith in Jesus Christ and became an incredible follower of our Lord can you say amen hallelujah but the story is not over you see, when I was praying with him, he had already been a believer for a year and a half. On the day that I was praying for him, he was just accepted to be a brand new student into the Bible school to become a pastor in the Assemblies of God. Can you say man? Isn't that amazing? Amazing. Today, well, since we took this photo, he's already planted two churches. He was a Saul that became a modern day Paul. See, this is what's happening in Africa. Africa for Jesus. And this is what God's doing. If you'll open your spiritual eyes, what he's doing right here in Urbandale. I'm going to sing a song, and then you'll never invite me back here again. <laughs> when I flew back from Miami to Malawi, Africa, I entered that Monday morning a class of 16 students, very bright, very gifted individuals, ready to go and plant churches, leave their backgrounds, their businesses, their families. Missionaries. They had heard about Riyaz and the texts that I had received from our other student that graduated in the class before them. And they were just as emotional. And before I could start the class, all of a sudden, in the very back in the center was Gideon Banda. 6'3", 240 pounds, and he stood and he cleared his voice and said, Dr. Easter, can I say something? And I said, sure. And all of a sudden, tears, become, tears began to come down his face. I can see it. He's, he wasn't an emotional man. He cleared his throat and composed himself and he said, we heard about Riaz. He said, you know, all my life, I've had very little compared to the world's standards. I'm a poor man. He said, but I'm also a rich man, unlike the world's standards. He said, because everything I have is because someone took the time to tell me about Jesus and it changed my life. And now I get to use my life he said, I get to use my life for God's glory. He said, send me to the hard place, I'll go. And all of a sudden, a young man from another country nearby the border of Malawi stood up, pulled him up, looked at him, and then looked at me and said, no. He said, send me to the hard place. He said, I'm only here because of a scholarship. I still, as a grown man, sleep on the mat of a floor. He said, you know, I never knew about the gospel until someone shared with me about Jesus. He said, it changed my whole purpose in life. 
And all of a sudden, all 16 of them, no longer talking to me, no longer directing their thoughts towards me, only to God, lifting their hands, standing around those tables, tears just flowing down their faces, saying, oh God, use me, use me, use me, use me. And we began to sing together, Mulungu, Angate. Angate, Angate Mulungu, Angate Sale Pera Sona, Mulungu, Angate, Angate, Angate Mulungu, Angate Sale Pera Sona. God can do anything, anytime, anywhere. God can do anything he never fails <clears throat> you see every single one of you in this room matters to god more than you'll ever know you are made in his image you're the object of his love and desire to save and the capacity that's already inside of you, whether you even realize it, can be worked, can be exercised, can be moved to receive his grace, be changed by his grace, because God wants you to have significance, to use your life for his redemptive purposes, not just in you, but through you. He wants that for all of us. He wants that for every person in Africa and every person in the world. And the question that we have as we close this morning is this. What motivates you? No matter who you are in this room. Low self-esteem, high self-esteem. Good economic challenge, hard economic challenge. Great opportunity, less opportunity, no matter who we are. He calls all of us equally to use our lives for his kingdom. And as you prepare to fill out your faith promise, what is God saying to you? How do you pray more? How do you share more? How do you live it out more? How do you give more? Because every soul matters. You matter. And may God use you. All for Jesus, amen? Amen.